Thank you all for joining us tonight for a very special program. We have five distinguished speakers who are going to address the topic pros and cons of BDS. Thank you everyone. Thank you to the Cousins Club for the kind invitation. I want to start just by kind of sharing my personal journey into the documentary that I'm making. I did my undergrad at the University of Chicago where I studied history. After graduating, I was still on the path towards academia, but I took a slight detour to go work for Al Jazeera English as a journalist. While I was at Al Jazeera, I was incredibly frustrated with the sort of notions of objectivity and objective reporting which I find is incredibly limiting and actually only serves the powerful. I mean, rather than objectivity, it's really just a false equivalency. It's a subject I can go on and on and on about, as I did to many of my coworkers at the time. But if anyone's interested, I'd highly recommend an exchange that Glenn Greenwald had with the New York Times uh, in a piece called, Is Glenn Greenwald the Future of News? I eventually left, but not to return to academia. Rather, I decided that after reading the work of someone called Tim O'Brien in a book called The Time That Remains, that I was more interested in actually really deconstructing these ideas of objectivity and going into uh, what he calls story truth and telling my personal truth. And I felt that I can do that through film, and film was the way that I could reach people. For my first uh, documentary, I chose to tackle the BDS movement, which I felt would be very easy. Um, obviously, that's a joke. I'm not naive enough to think it's easy. I'm just arrogant enough to think that I could actually pull it off. <laughs> We're still entering post-production. It's not finished. It's going to be an hour and a half feature-length film. We are still fundraising. My producer wanted me to say that. It's very difficult, obviously, in an hour and a half film to really tackle the different facets surrounding this movement. So you can only imagine what a 10 to 15 minute talk looks like to me. We traveled to Palestine, to Turkey, to France and the UK, to Brazil and Argentina, all across the United States and to South Africa as well. We interviewed people from some of the most incredible activists on the ground that no one has heard of, but who are really doing some incredible work to figures like Angela Davis and Glenn Greenwald, Noam Chomsky and Roger Waters. The BDS movement, as some of you may know, I found that oftentimes, even when I'm speaking to Palestine activists, they often don't know um, some of the most basic fundamentals uh, about the BDS movement. It was uh, officially launched in 2005 from Palestine, which is a very important thing that's often ignored, that it was launched from Palestine after you know up to 170 uh, civil society organizations got together and issued a call on the international community to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel. This is important because oftentimes the question is posed, why are you in the United States boycotting Israel and not X country, whatever country you guys want to include? And the important thing is, the reason for that is because Palestinians from Palestine have called on us to act in solidarity with them and to boycott Israel. It's a legitimate argument, but you're going to have to contend with that. But for me, the answer is incredibly simple. And when I pose this to the dozens and dozens of people that I interviewed who are all BDS supporters, they said the same thing. They said, if tomorrow Native Americans and Muslim Americans and Black Americans and all the different marginalized groups in the United States got together and issued a call on me, a British artist, to boycott that country, I would have to seriously consider it. That hasn't happened, but it has happened in Palestine. And it's always important that we don't center ourselves in the discussion like many people do, but that the shift is constantly moving back to the people in Palestine. The movement was launched um, and it was modeled off of, it didn't directly imitate or copy, but it was modeled off of the boycott apartheid South Africa campaign that reached its height in the 1980s. I interviewed a lot of South Africans, a lot of notable South Africans, um, not only black South Africans that led the struggle, but even white and Jewish South Africans that stood in solidarity with them at the time. Uh, one thing that they admire about the BDS movement is actually how well thought out it is. 
And this is actually something that people try to use to discredit it by saying it's completely arbitrary, it's anti-Semitic in the sense that it just targets all Jews or all Israelis. But what I've learned from these South Africans is actually this is completely misguided because the Boycott South Africa movement was actually much more wide in terms of its scope. It pretty much just called on everyone to boycott anything having to do with South Africa, including just any ordinary South African academic. But when it comes to BDS, it's not actually calling on people to boycott ordinary Israelis or even the country as a whole. For instance, BDS activists, many of whom I've spoken to, would actually encourage a lot of people in this room, including, to go visit and see for themselves. Just don't go on a trip that's funded by an institution that's complicit in the occupation. What the boycott campaign has actually done is they've targeted institutions, institutions that are complicit in the occupation colonization of Palestine. What this means is, and I'll give you a very quick example, if an Israeli academic was coming to your university here to lecture on their research on heart surgery, they wouldn't actually call on people to boycott that event. But if the Dean of Humanities of Tel Aviv University is coming to speak at your university representing Tel Aviv University, an institution that's deeply complicit in the occupation and colonization of Palestinian lands, that is a boycottable action. And this distinction, according to South Africans themselves, who are extremely active in the anti-apartheid movement, is not just crucial. To them, it demonstrates the intelligence of the movement. And the fact that it's not just something that's emotional or, or, or not strategic or not tactful or, not, or doesn't really take into account the fact that the ultimate goal is actually to put pressure on these institutions. The next thing that I want to talk about are the three demands, which are very crucial to understanding the BDS movement because people seem to understand that there's this movement, but many people don't seem to understand what it's actually calling for, which would be naturally my first question. And it's calling for three things. Number one is the end of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and all the occupied territories. Number two is equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel. And number three is the right of return. Obviously, number three is oftentimes the most hotly debated. One person I spoke to during my filming put it quite well, in my opinion. He said, People are oftentimes framing it in the sense that Palestinians are demanding the right of return. But let's be clear about something. It's not Palestinians that are making a demand. It's Israel that's making a demand. Israel's demanding that it maintain a racist policy in which if you are a Jew with no connection to the land, you can go back to that land. But if you are a Palestinian, such as myself, whose grandparents were forced off that land, I cannot go back. That's the demand that's being made, and it's the one that's being honored by all of us if we're not speaking out against it. And I think that that's an incredible, incredibly important way of looking at it because we need to stop framing it always in the sense of just asking for our rights and rather make it that something is out of order and we're trying to restore order to that. Other thing I want to talk about that's been happening recently and which became a major subject of the documentary, even though I hadn't intended on it, was the BDS movement's ability to build alliances with movements worldwide, which I didn't really know the scope of it until I started going and meeting with activists. I didn't know how heavily connected the BDS movement was to the movements fighting to end the militarization of the police in Brazil, for instance. But they really are deeply embedded there. But there's a reason for that. It's because Israel is deeply embedded in the oppression that Brazilians are facing every single day. They're training their police forces and they are arming them. They're giving uh, specific kinds of surveillance technology and drone technology to Brazilian forces. In fact, the more I started learning about why BDS movements were growing in different parts of the world, the more I started learning about how deeply embedded um, Israel is in impression that's happening all over the world, including in the United States. I can't tell you how many police forces, local police forces in this country, are sent to Israel for training. It's, it's, it's actually shocking the number of it. I can't tell you how many police forces in this country are armed with weapons as crazy as like grenade launchers because the Israelis are giving them to them. The fact that the BDS movement has joined in with this resurgence of internationalism I think is incredibly important because as someone put it to me, you know, one of the things I asked someone, I won't say who, so hopefully you guys can watch the documentary and see who it was, but I asked how come now we're talking about black American solidarity with Palestine as if it's a new thing. This was really common, especially during the civil rights era. So how come now we're talking about it like it's new? In other words, what happened in the middle? And she put it really interestingly, where she talked about the impact of neoliberalism, not just in terms of how it shaped the world economy, but even how it shaped resistance movements, in the sense that the internationalism that once existed, especially in the 1960s, completely went away, especially by the time you reached the 80s, where even resistance movements were starting to look inward, and they were starting to become nationalized, and they were even starting to become divided within 
themselves. And what's happened now is incredible because you have people protesting in Ferguson who are talking to people protesting in Gaza. And I think this is important because when you have Israeli military technology that's being used to support the building of a wall on the border with Mexico, when you have corporations like G4S and others that are complicit in oppression in different parts of the world, and when Trump and Netanyahu are clearly uh, citing each other as examples, then it's obvious that all these forces of oppression see their causes as united. And so why shouldn't resistance movements also see their causes as united worldwide and try to fight these forces of oppression? And I think that the BDS movement has done an incredible job in tapping into that sentiment, that, that regrowth of internationalism that's been happening worldwide. And I think it's very important that it continue. Are there drawbacks to the BDS movement? There are internal critiques. Um, no movement is perfect. No um, tactic is perfect. They're constantly having to evolve. But I think that the BDS movement never sold itself as that. I think the biggest flaw has been on the part of conscientious people, actually, in different parts of the world who have not done their due diligence to really study this movement and actually see what it's about. And unfortunately, have bought into a lot of lies and deliberate myths that have been spread at the expense of what I think to be a very powerful movement that has the ability that has the ability and actually has already accomplished the goal of changing the conversation at the very least. The BDS uh, issue is a very emotional issue, and I'm going to try to try to take the emotion out of it and um, talk about it in terms of uh, a, a rational rational views. I hope I hope I succeed in doing that. And I have to say that um, in a couple of ways, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the BDS movement. My 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 uh, assignment here is to speak against BDS, but I um, I agree with one key. A BDS objective, which is to remove Israel occupation from the West Bank. I, I, I agree with that. I also acknowledge uh, the opposition in the West Bank to Israel occupation um, and, and, and the Israeli treatment of, of Palestinians, which I think has uh, has uh, 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 has a lot to be desired. Um, it's very arbitrary and uh, a very a very very punitive. Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, a negotiated peace, which I strongly support, which would give the Palestinians their own state, would take take away, take care of the whole BDS um, BDS issue. Um, so I have, I have mixed feelings. But uh, my case against BDS focuses on BDS as an instrument, not as an objective. Um, um, a, a, a key point is that I feel BDS will not influence Israel to end the occupation. And the reason is that the Israeli government um, interprets BDS as a threat to its very existence. Now, I th that's an error. I, I, I don't think that BDS is designed to do that. But it, the Israeli government in, in, in interprets it as, as existential, an existential problem and does everything it can to resist BDS. It's, it's not going to concede. Um, and, and, and anything, knowing what the Israeli policy is and knowing about uh, its institutions. Second point is that the Israeli economy is not so easily affected by the BDS type campaign. One can ask, you know, what, what has been the material effect of BDS since 2005 when we're talking about nearly 15 years? And the, the, the truth is, not very much. Um, foreign direct investment in Israel is at an all time high. Um, Israel, in fact, its economy doesn't depend so much on exports of commodities as much on, as on business to business products such as intellectual property where it's harder to mobilize consumers. Um, um, I, I, I can see that BDS has increased the identity of Palestinians and I, that's an important thing to do. But I, I, the, the Palestinian nationalism I think was already there even before BDS. Um, and, and, there, and there's a contradiction in, in the Israeli government attitude to BDS. It insists that BDS has had no political effect. On the other hand, it, it looks at BDS as an ex existential threat. I, I, both of those can't be true. I, I, I see myself, I have to say, as a kind of an equal opportunity critic here. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just as critical of, of Israeli behavior as I am of, of Palestinian behavior. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't say that the BDS issue uh, uh, um, suggests that one side is 100% is right and the other side is 100% wrong. Um, <coughs> Uh, many of my friends, however, do, do say that. Um, I, I divide from them, and sometimes it's difficult to talk to them. What BDS has done in this country, 
as, as, as is to focus attention on the debate on college campuses, especially, where both BDS strength and opposition to it are greatest, from what I can see. And on the college campuses, parents of Jewish college students worry that their son or daughter will become sympathetic to BDS. So anti-BDS groups have proliferated on college campuses. But I think that's a sideshow. The fact is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not going to be decided on the American college campus. It's only going to be decided when Jews and Palestinians cooperate in Israel through a process of negotiation. Uh, uh, Ali talked about Israeli oppression elsewhere in the world. Well, the United States has also been a, 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 an agent of that too. I think the, 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 the oppression factor is really a side issue as well. The, the main question has to be the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. To go hunting for uh, what Israel has done wrong elsewhere, arguably, is to avoid the main issue. Now, how to get a Palestinian state. Now, um, I, would, I would distinguish two purposes for a BDS type program. One purpose is influence, and the, and the second purpose is, is punishment. And the issue should be, how can Israel be pushed or influenced, but not how it can be punished? And since BDS doesn't influence the Israeli government, or I don't anticipate influencing the Israeli government, it's important is, it's, uh, it's, it's entirely as punishment as sanctions. I, I'm opposed to sanctions in general. Je sanctions tend to be chosen when people are not sure what else they should do, when, when nothing else is available. They don't want to use force, but they have to show that they're opposed to somebody else. That's what governments do. I think sanctions are really overrated. Good examples are the sanctions against Venezuela, and, and Iran. When the United States has, has given sanctions against Venezuela and Iran, I, my hunch is they haven't really thought carefully uh, what the effects of those sanctions are going to be. And in fact, what, what the sanctions do is make things worse, uh, at least for the common person. And they do not accomplish what they set out, they set out to do. And, and, and that's, that's really kind of, kind of tragic. Um, uh, the, the influence potential of the United States is not what the United States thinks it sh is or should be. So, so sanctions are a kind of empty. Uh, they, they show opposition, but they don't, uh, they don't realistically, uh, they're not really realistically able to accomplish what, they, what they, they're supposed to accomplish. Now, you might say, well, what about South Africa? So um, uh, Ali mentioned that it, the, the BDS campaign is modeled after the campaign against South Africa. But there are some differences between the South African campaign and the, and the BDS uh, campaign. Um, in the case of, of the 1980s, Republicans in Congress divided from Ronald Reagan. It was a very interesting story. And, and why did they divide from, from, from Ronald Reagan, from their, from their Republican president? Because they felt that Ronald Reagan wasn't doing enough for American civil rights. And so the issue in South Africa was linked to the need for the Republicans to do more on the civil rights front in this country. And also, in that, in that instance, bipartisanship uh, uh, was far, far, far more uh, 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 significant than it is than it is today. You don't, you don't have bipartisan partisanship in, in Congress at all. And, and, and finally, um, when in the case of South Africa, the United States was South Africa's primary trading partner, um, supplying about 15 percent, as I understand, of its imports at that time. So it, it had more influence potential on South Africa. It's true there was a grassroots campaign, but I, it's also important to note that the. The, the campaign of influence went through Congress, and ultimately Ronald Reagan was overridden by Congress in, in, that, in that campaign. And so it seems to me that the, the, um, uh, the apartheid issue is only an issue in Israeli occupied territory. If you end the occupation, the apartheid issue goes away. And, and it seems to me that BDS will also go away. It's nice to see all the BDS buttons around. It seems that the argument has been made even before we started speaking, which is nice as well. When we look at the demands, which are, I agree with Ali, are, are, it's crucial to see what the demands are. What are the demands of this movement? What are the demands of the BDS movement? And I think that when we look at these demands, we can see that they are remedial. There's no talk about harming anyone. It's only talk about restoring the rights. They're restorative, like Ali was saying, and remedial. Ending this military occupation in parts of Palestine where there is military occupation, affording equal rights to Palestinians who live in other parts of Palestine, and then allowing for the right of the Palestinians to return, which are the third part of the, you know, the third population of Palestinians who live outside of Palestine, who should have the right to return to their homes and their land. So it's completely remedial and it's completely reasonable, probably the most reasonable demands 
any any res any resistance organization, any any national movement has ever ever made. And in many ways, I think that the call for BDS, uh, by making that call, Palestinian civil societies have given us not only a roadmap, but a gift. Because people often scratch their head and wonder, how do we deal with this issue of Palestine? What's the right thing to do? How do we support the people of Palestine in their struggle for justice and freedom and equality? And rather than scratching our heads, we can listen to what Palestinians have asked us to do which is very, very clear. Impose boycott, divestment, and sanctions upon the state of Israel in order to remedy the situation into which Palestinians have been placed as a result of the creation of the state of Israel. Now, I think it's important to, um, I think it's important to come to terms with the fact that the occupation of Palestine did not start in 1967. This uh, notion that somehow there is a part of Palestine that's occupied, and then there's Israel, which is a legitimate entity, is completely false. Because as if you were to talk to millions of Palestinians who live in refugee camps, and millions of Palestinians who live all over the world, they will tell you their homes, their land, is not in the West Bank or in the Gaza Strip. In fact, the majority of the people who live in the Gaza Strip are not from the Gaza Strip. And the Gaza Strip is not a natural entity. The Gaza Strip is a strip that was created by Israel as a place into which they kicked out Palestinians from other parts of Palestine. So again, going back to the demands of BDS, they deal not only with this one part, small part of Palestine, and the issues that relate to that small part of Palestine, which is what used to be the West Bank, which by the way no longer exists, and Israel immediately when it took the West Bank in 1967 began calling it Judea and Samaria and populated it with, uh, with Israeli Jews or Jews from other places and built exclusively for Jewish people at the expense of Palestinians. But then we take a look and we see, well, this is exactly what had happened in all other parts of Palestine. So there isn't a Palestine that is not occupied. And there isn't an Israel that is legitimate because all of Israel is, was built on occupied Palestine. Israel is an entity that was built for people who are from outside of Palestine, in Palestine, which was a country that was populated, developed, had its own history and, and, and civilization, and one came at the expense of the other. All of Palestine has been occupied since the State of Israel was established. And the laws of apartheid which govern Palestine have been in place since Israel was established. When Jimmy Carter wrote his book, Palestine, Apart Peace, Not Apart uh, Peace Not Apartheid, he emphasized that he's always talking about the West Bank. But if you take a look at the Israeli law books, if you take a look at the, the laws that were passed by the Israeli Knesset, by the Israeli House of Representatives, from the very beginning, these are apartheid laws. Israel defined itself as an apartheid state without using the word apartheid. Because I have rights that Palestinians do not. I have rights that he doesn't, that he does not. His family has been in Palestine much longer than mine. If he wants to go back, he has to be interrogated for eight hours and he's given a visa, as many other Palestinians, of course. So Israel defined itself as an apartheid regime, as an illegitimate, illegal regime on Palestine. And again, this is not only on a part of Palestine, but all of Palestine. Now, like I said, the call for BDS is not only a roadmap for those of us who care, but it is a gift. The issue of solidarity versus resistance is really, really important, I think, in this context. The time for solidarity with Palestinians has been over a long time ago. I think I said this last time I was here. Palestine should be equated with a human being bleeding to death on the ground, bleeding to death rapidly. Standing around and encouraging them to hang on is not gonna do any good. What is required is joining the resistance and BDS gives us the tools. BDS gives us the method, the, 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 the roadmap to participate in the resistance with the Palestinians. 
What is required is not, you know, free Palestine t-shirts and buttons as much as I like these buttons. What is required is for us to participate in the resistance by participating and by uh, accepting and doing everything we can to promote and push, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the state of Israel. So it's an opportunity for us to participate even though we're here. We don't have to be there to, to, to participate in this. We are over here, people of conscience all over the world participate. And as Ali mentioned, this is something that's been going, that is happening all over the world. People are participating because they realize, and by the way, other resistance groups and other groups of, of uh, um, other groups that are disenfranchised around the world are joining this and, and, and insult in, in, in the resistance. And it's not an accident that probably the most supportive country in the world is South Africa. The BDS activism in South Africa is, comes out of a sense of duty in many ways. I've been to South Africa. They say, the world helped us, now it's our turn to help. Palestine and BDS is what helped us, and this is how we want to help Palestine. Now, I think it's important to um, take a look a little bit at how, how Israel sees this. Israel does view uh, what they call the BDS, the BDS, as an existential threat. But I think they're right, which is why they fight it so viciously. Israel cannot afford, and, Israel, and, it, and the Israelis know this, they cannot afford to allow any resistance to Israel to be legitimized. Why has Israel never agreed for the last you know, since 1967, has done everything it possibly could to make sure that there will never be a Palestinian state. Because the question, the next question is, wait a minute, what makes the West Bank any different from the Galilee, or the Nakab Desert, or Jerusalem, or Yaffa, or Haifa? They're all occupied. Why do these Palestinians deserve certain rights and these Palestinians don't? So it's an all or nothing game for Israel. It's, it's, it's a zero sum game. They're either all right, or they know they have no chance. So they're absolutely right to see it as an existential threat, and I think it is a good thing. We need to make sure that we push forward as hard as we possibly can so that the three demands of BDS do become a reality. Ending the military occupation, equal rights, and the right of return. Now, I was in Jerusalem a couple of years ago when Yedioka uh, Fornot stand with us and a bunch of other uh, organizations, the Zionist organizations, organized a major conference in Jerusalem. And I happened to be there, so I signed up and I went to participate. Thousands of people, one of the largest events I've ever seen. Free food and all kinds of cool things. And everybody from the President of the State of Israel, government ministers, heads of political parties, uh, former heads of the Mossad, the Mossad operative, Shabak, which is a secret police operative, former generals, you name it. We're all there to speak. They were all there to speak, whether they were talking about how the Mossad has not yet utilized everything they have in their toolbox in order to get rid of the BDS leadership, hinting at assassinations and so forth, to people who actually say, well, this BDS is just nonsense, it doesn't do anything. But if it doesn't do anything, why is there such a major conference? Israeli TV has done several major documentaries, two in which I was featured, actually, um, as this big devil, you know, BDS monster with my BDS button, you know, to somehow show that there's this incredible threat and we must do everything we possibly can. The Israeli Ministry of Education has an online course for young high school kids who go overseas to exchange programs. And they have to take this course in order to qualify. So I signed up and I took the course. <laughs> and you hear these little, you know, little lectures, little lessons by all these important people within, within Israeli politics, Israeli Ministry, Ministry of Education, and, other, and others, explaining how BDS is the following. BDS is a, uh, it's a coalition of green and red. Green are fanatic Muslims. Red are fanatic communists and anarchists. And on this issue, they came together in order to destroy Israel. This is how BDS is explained to young Israeli high school students. 
and therefore we must fight it and we must explain it and we must show what a wonderful democracy, thriving society, liberal we are, and so on and so forth. You know? And you know, God knows how many articles and, and, and so forth in the Israeli press and, and on and on and on. This is a serious threat and I think we need to embrace it and we need to run with it. Now I think it's important to state that when we talk about an existential threat, we're talking about an existential threat to a regime, not to a people. They like to conflate these two and say, well, of course, they want to they wanna kill us all. They're all Nazis. They want to kill Jews. This is complete nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Most of the people who are you know, leading this movement, who are brilliant people, it's a very small group, I never wouldn't even recognize a gun if they saw one. It's not about that. It's not about taking away my privilege. It's extending the privilege that I as an Israeli have to the people who are the indigenous people of Palestine. Allowing them to return. If you talk about the right of Jews to return because we were there 3,000 years ago, well, Palestinians were there 70 years ago. So they certainly should have a right to return, and so on. So it's all about how Israel is. So this is how Israel frames it. This is how Israel frames it. And actually, I, I think they're right because if, if, if we all work hard, if we all do what we are called to do, which I believe is our duty as people of conscience, to make sure that our elected officials understand that boycotting is not only a right, it's a duty. And helping Palestinians in their struggle for justice and freedom and equality is a duty. It's not just a right. Then we will see the results much faster. And Israel will end up like apartheid South Africa on its knees and will collapse. These are important things I think for all of us to, to take into account and then to go home and start writing those letters and calling our elected officials and so forth. And then, you know, and I'll finish with this. I mean, everybody here in this room, I believe, knows about the horrors of Gaza. Two and a half million people without, without clean water. The destruction, the killing. A child in Gaza with a curable disease will die. A child living a mile away in an Israeli colony will live because the access to good health care is available to the Israelis but not to Palestinians. And on and on and on. So if this does not wake us up, if this does not push us to go as far as we can in promoting the idea of BDS, then I don't know what will. It's a question of values. And I believe if we do believe in justice, and we do believe in equality, and we do believe in uh, people's right to, to be free, then we must embrace it and we must act. Because it's a question of participating in the resistance. This uh, debate is more important than the debates that we see on television between the Democrats. Uh, I think it deals with a significant issue that if we resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and one of, the, one of the ways that is being discussed is this issue today. When my father was 84 years old, he typed his memoir. He had a misdiagnosed Parkinson disease. It turned out that it wasn't a Parkinson disease, that he had thyroid. And because of that, his hand trembled. And he had to type his memoirs. He was a very good writer. And he wrote about his childhood and about his family in Fallujah in Iraq. The Jews lived in Iraq for 2,500 years. They were, they, they were the same as their neighbors the Muslims. They had the same music, they looked the same, the same culture. Even the prayers were very, very similar. The music in the prayer was very similar. When my parents immigrated to Israel, or at that time Palestine, because they came 1936, my mother hardly spoke Hebrew. They spoke Arabic. 
They spoke Arabic between everyone, between with their aunts and their uncles. My father's name was Abu Abraham. My uncle was Abu Silman. Abu, I had another uncle, Abu Yaqub, Abu Eliyahu. We had the same culture. My father wrote in his memoirs that his father, my grandfather, in World War I, escaped the Turkish Ottoman soldiers who came to kidnap young men to take them into the military. And as my grandfather was sitting in the tent of the Bedouin near the Euphrates River, a group of soldiers, Turkish soldiers, spotted him. And they came galloping on their horses to grab him. And the Bedouin who lived in that tent, they pulled out their swords, they stood in front of the tent and they said, no, you cannot come in. There are guests at our tent. And they protected my grandfather and the other Jews that lived in the tent. What I'm trying to tell you is that we are really the same people. Jews and Muslim, we are the same people. But since then, unfortunately, we developed what I call the hate industry. And what does the hate industry do? The hate industry brings up issues upon issues upon issues for us to fight about. What, what, these are wedge issues. And they started, you know, they started even in Iraq when they bombed the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. It started with all the time. You know, I am upset about um, um, Rashida Talibi not being allowed to enter Israel. I'm very upset about it. I think it's, it's extreme weakness on the part of Israel. But this is just one another issue that is coming up. Is Trump anti-Semitic? Is Obama Muslim? Or the occupation in Jerusalem? These are all issues that are coming up. And, the, and all these issues are around nationality, religion, and identity. Because those issues bring the worst in us. It brings us to fight each other on an emotional level. And when we fight on an emotional level, we tend to hate each other and we tend to disagree. And the real purpose, the real purpose of all these hate issues is to keep us from even thinking about the ultimate issue. And the ultimate issue is peace. Now, do we ever hear about peace? No. We always hear about the issues that are meant to keep us fighting each other. Because there are some very, very strong economic and political powers that it's, it's not in their interest that we will make peace. And they want us to never even consider, not, not to discuss the peace itself, but not even consider the possibility of approaching that subject. We never really approach that subject. Do you know that in the last 100 years, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been going on for over 100 years. There has never, ever been a single a single peace plan published. Not once. We have never been, we never really discussed that. Why is it that we have very smart politicians, very smart people in the State Department, in many State Departments around the world? Presidents, vice presidents, senators, 35,000 people are working for the State Department. And not a single peace plan has never been published. Now, a peace plan is not a secret plan. 
a war plan is, yeah, you keep it secret and you attack in the middle of the night because it's a secret plan. But a peace plan is a plan that you publish and you go to whoever you feel is your enemy and you say, here, I want to make peace with you. I want my people to survive. I want your people to survive. And here is my peace plan. Open book. Read it. Tell me what's wrong with it. It's never been published. Not by Israel, not by the Palestinian, not by the American, the Russians, the French, the German, the British. All we are doing is fighting each other and we are keeping the peace away. Now you may say to me, hey Joseph, you're, you're wrong. There has been two state solution peace plan. And that demonstrates how low our standards are. We are actually calling the two state, we're using the word solution, and we, they have convinced us that two state is a solution, just because they, were, they put the word solution after two state, and then they convinced us that it's a peace plan. It's the opposite of a peace plan. This is how low our standards are. Two state is a segregation plan. It's basically saying Jews will be here and, 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 and non-Jews will be over there and there will be a wall between them. And they will be, in order to visit each other, in order, they'll need a passport, they'll need to go through a wall, they need, where well, they lived there for thousands of years before, both of them. I want to show you a full page ad that our organization, the Israeli Palestinian Confederation, placed in the New York Times on October 1st, 2012. And in this ad, we said, on, a, on December 12, 2012, there will be an election, an election to create a confederation government, a government, a democratic government, a secular government for the people of Israel and Palestine together. A and we publish the, the website and we publish the constitution on the website. We published our contact information, everything. Now, the New York Times is the most, probably the most liberal paper in America. It's read all over the world. It's read by professors, by the State Department, by senators, by the White House. Now, how many journalists, and it's read by journalists, not only from the New York Times, they probably get a free subscription to, the, to their own paper. Full page ad, they cannot miss it. And it wasn't in the sports section, it was in the news section. <laughs> How many journalists do you think contacted us to ask, what is this? How many articles were written about it, about the peace plan that we proposed? The answer is zero, not a single one. And what does it tell you? It tells you that, you, know, you may say, well, the confederation idea is a bad idea. Fine. But it also tells you that there is no interest in peace. They have deflected us. They have suppressed us. They have suppressed really all of us from actually thinking about peace. We only think about how much we are angry at the other and about all these issues that we need to fight each other. But actually dealing with peace? No. If we put an ad, if we placed an ad, full page ad in the New York Times and we said on December 12, 2012, aliens will be landing from space. Now, 
we would get some calls. At least to see who are these idiots that are spending money for a full page ad in the New York Times. Not even that, we didn't even get calls to see who, who we are, who are these idiots. This is how far we are removed from the idea of peace. So what we are doing here is fighting with each other. There is not even an interest in the subject of peace. Now, we, the IPC, we, propose, we made a proposal for a very serious formula for peace. A formula that would protect the Israelis, all their interests, all their issues, and the Palestinians. A formula that would actually create a mechanism to solve the issue of the occupation, the issue of the, of, uh, the refugees. A real formula, not only to, to make peace, but also to live together in peace, because we are really the same people. We need to stop fighting with each other. So what I am asking you, please always, always ask, what about peace? At least that. At least get to that issue. So Beal is a Christian peace organization that was founded in Jerusalem and is one of the signers of the original request for BDS. And accordingly, the Friends of Sabeel throughout the world, and I think we're now in 15 countries, um, has been a staunch supporter of BDS from the beginning. That said, I'm not going to talk for or against BDS. What I am going to talk about is what's going on in your Congress to fight BDS. Earlier this year, if you follow the news, there was a big flap in the Senate about the first Senate bill, S-1. Normally the first Senate bill is identified as that area which is most important to the senators in the United States. And normally it's a budget. Not very understandable. But not this year. This year it was a package of Middle East bills including <laughs> combat, combating BDS and it was called the Combating Act of 2019. And it was Apex, APAC's dream bill to counter BDS. It was essentially written by APAC. 22 Democrats and Senator Paul, Rand Paul, voted no against the bill. And the bill was aimed directly at BDS, making it illegal. And the reason they voted no was they cited First Amendment concerns. Now, those of us who followed BDS for some time know that in the 27 states, including California, that have passed BDS legislation, they are all being challenged in the courts as being unconstitutional a violation of the First Amendment. And it's wending its way through the courts. But the Senate had multiple purposes in mind when it passed this legislation. First of all, it intended to demonstrate that the Republicans' support of Israel was better than the Democratic support of Israel, and thus gain Jewish voters. It was intended to provide political and legal cover for the argument that banning, banning BDS does not violate the free speech rights under the First Amendment. And I'll talk more about that. It's rather clever how they do that. 
It's also intended to encourage state laws that violate the First Amendment. So they wanted to have more states passing BDS laws. It was intended to tip the balance in the court cases in, from the 27 states with BDS laws in favor of BDS laws. And lastly, it was intended to equate BDS through language with anti-Semitism. Getting around the First Amendment was the chief operational component. And to give you a little legalese, I don't mean to uh, weigh you down with this, but the operative provision says states and local measures designed to divest the assets, prohibit investment, or restrict contracting with an entity that knowingly engages in commerce that is intended to penalize inflict economic harm on or impose policy positions on the government of Israel are not preempted by federal law. Now that last phrase, not preempted by federal law, wipes out the First Amendment. So we have a Senate voting to rearrange the um, amendments. In other words, if the state punishes entities or individuals engaged in BDS, the federal laws, does not preempt state laws. And that is written into our Constitution, that the federal law does preempt state laws. And we all know that because of the, during the 60s, many of the states had laws on segregation, and the federal government said, nope, can't have those, we preempt them. Now, the House has not taken any action on Senate Bill 1, so it's still sitting in limbo. However, the House has its own BDS bill, which came up in July, House Bill 246. And it opposed efforts to delegitimize the State of Israel and the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement targeting Israel. So it was pretty clear what it was aimed at. However, it reflected the split in the Democratic Caucus, which you've all been reading about, between the progressives and the moderates. The bill didn't come to a vote until July 23rd, whereas the Senate bill was voted on in February. So there was a lot of arguing and talking that went on before they finally got the bill to a vote. And the vote was 398 in favor and 17 against. A huge majority voted in favor of backing measures that made boycotting Israel difficult, if not illegal. However, as part of the compromise, the bill was made a non-binding resolution. Now, for those of you who are into the congressional machinations, that kind of bill amounts to an announcement. It has no legal standing at all. It's the kind of thing that is used on, around the holidays and on Thanksgiving, wishing the world happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> the bill basically does nothing legally, or does it? One of the things it does do is it gets each representative on record daring them to vote no. And only 17 took that dare up. The BDS bills are definitely political. There's no question about it. Republicans want to paint the Democrats as anti-Semitic, so the Jewish vote will go Republican. The Democrats want to show support for Israel and opposition to any campaign against Israel, while still defending the First Amendment by passing H.R. 246 with a large majority. One thing about 246 that you should be aware of, it creates a touchstone with its language which can be used in future legislation. 
And this is a technique which is often used in Congress to develop a vocabulary and a sense of the House or Senate, as the case may be, on what they want to do in the future. When 392 representatives out of 435 members agree on the framing language of an issue, you can bet they will return to the resolution's language as a reference and template for future legislation, including binding resolutions. Bills giving the resolution teeth are already being discussed in committee. They were introduced in July. The bill makes it clear that it doesn't tolerate BDS campaigns of any kind against Israel. Now that's kind of interesting. Israel was singled out, no other country was mentioned. The bill implies that BDS is an existential threat to Israel by stating that BDS campaigns seek to destroy Israel. And we could get into a rather interesting discussion if we did dig into that statement and say, well, what does it seek to destroy? The state of Israel? The Jewish people? What? Is it aimed at the Zionism within Israel? Is it aimed at the right-wing parties in Israel? What does it seek to destroy? The bill upholds free speech, all right. Include, and including criticism of the U.S. and foreign governments, but it never mentions BDS, not once. Supposedly it was a name aimed at it, but it didn't mention it. Therefore, Representatives Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and John Lewis sponsored a resolution that seeks to affirm that all Americans have the right to participate in boycotts in pursuit of civil and human rights at home and abroad as protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution and opposes unconstitutional legislative efforts to limit the use of boycotts to further civil rights at home and abroad. In other words, they're bringing the focus back to the First Amendment saying that BDS is, in fact, protected by the First Amendment. The resolution concludes with strong support for negotiations and a two-state solution, which is interesting because Trump is ambivalent on it at best, and Netanyahu said it's dead, nothing to talk about. The backers of the House resolution included the entire Jewish community, from the Republican Jewish coalition to APAC, the whole spectrum, right to left. The people or the groups that were opposed to it included JVP, which should, should not be surprising. They've been a stalwart in the uh, campaigns in the various states and the Zionist Organization of America, who opposed it on rather interesting terms. They didn't like the two-state uh, two solution being mentioned. So it's not over yet. What it comes down to is the courts have the ball. It's up for them to make some decisions. Now, I'll point something else out to you. Trump has been busy since he moved into office filling uh, positions in the courts, and they are filled largely with conservative judges, to put it politely. So it's hard to say which way it's going to go, and it's not unexpected that it might go up to the Supreme Court, but how long that takes, nobody's quite sure. But BDS still lives, it still can be practiced, and it still hasn't been stopped by Congress. The reason that uh, Representative Zilhan Omar and Rashida and their delegation was refused entry is because Israel passed a law uh, saying that um, the Interior Ministry must refuse entry to uh, people who are known to support the call for BDS. 
and they have come out in public supporting it. Um, and it could be, again, it doesn't matter if they're members of the United States House of Representatives or they're young activists, um, they ban their entry. Jews, non-Jews, it makes no difference. Oh. So that is, that, that's, that's one thing that's, that's happening. In terms of the press in Israel, um, the opposition is absolute. Absolute, there is no dissent. When you talk to people, day-to-day -day people, as you talk you know, on a regular basis, uh, BDS, Hamas, and Iran are all in the same category. They are, they're, they're anti-Semitic, they want to kill the Jews, they want to destroy Israel. That is the discourse about BDS um, in Israel generally. Now, there are small groups, so there are a few individuals uh, who do support the boycott, who do support the call for boycott, of course. You know, uh, uh, very small groups, very few people. I, I agree with uh, Miko that the uh, opposition in Israel to BDS is across the board, uh, both on the political left and the right, and most individuals that I met, that I spoke with, are very much against BDS, and they see it as the, um, as anti-Semitic, basically. But I also noticed that there are elements in the Israeli society that understand that there has to be a solution for peace. They understand that. It's a minority, and I think there's also a minority in the Palestinian society that understand that there has to be a solution for peace. This is why I think the Confederation makes sense because as an Israeli or as a Palestinian, if you support the Confederation, you are not anti your own people. You are saying, huh, let me think about another solution. This, is, this gives them a way out. Because if you, if you paint it in black and white, people are just going to take one side, but you have to give them another formula for peace. And I think that there is no legitimate way for the Israelis or the Palestinians to articulate an objection to an Israeli-Palestinian confederation. They just don't have that way, a legitimate way. Now, if they want to sound racist, that's one thing. But if they want to articulate a, a position that would make them sound logical, not racist, the Confederation gives them a way out. There have been BDS movements within the Palestinian people for some years because Israel supplies the Palestinians with most of their essentials and they wanted to hit Israel where it hurts. But of course that didn't really work. And to top it all off, Israel passed laws making it illegal to practice BDS. You can get at least six months in jail for it. In addition to that, <clears throat> But three years ago, the um, Ministry of Strategic Affairs developed a list of 20 international organizations that support BDS. And that became the blacklist that was used by the government to keep travelers from coming into uh, Israel. So there is both an internal and external legal mechanism within Israel against BDS. That law that you fear, that, you, that you're opposed to, which suggests that you could be 
uh, penalized or, or imprisoned if you if you uh, use BDS action. But that law is uh, um, it, it's it, it's subject to political um, uh, uh, thinking. Uh, yeah, the 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 law. The, the, the only reason those congresswomen were denied entry was because Trump lobbied. We're not talking about Trump. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not rigorous, but I'm trying to say it's not rigorously applied. We don't have to follow someone else's narrative. We can come up with our own narrative. We can come up with our own solution. Be, because the idea, the idea of the idea of blaming each other has been going on for a hundred years. That's part of the hate industry. Uh, let's let's clear. I can see why there's a misunderstanding. Fine, I'll I'll clarify. First of all, I have to make it absolutely clear. I do not speak for BDS. I'm not part of of, of any organization. I'm not on any committee. I, my opinions are mine. So what I say does not necessarily ref reflect what somebody would say if they were actually representing, um, you know, the, the BDS movement officially. Um, now, what I said was, um, and if I say it, I'll clear, I'll, I'll, if I didn't say it exactly, I'll say it right now. That the three declared goals of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement are ending the occupation where the military occupation still exists in Palestine, equal rights for Palestinians with Israelis, and the right of the Palestinians recognizing and... Hold on. Excuse me. Hold on. Hey, I got the... I got the, I got the mic. Hold on. 8 million, 9 million, 10 million, it makes no difference. Their homes, their land, their rights are in Palestine. They have a right to return. That is absolute. In other words, that right, that right is absolute. Whether you, as an Israeli, like it or not, is not relevant because Israel was built on the destruction of Palestine. I think a lot that's been said, including from up here on this panel, has been incredibly condescending and patronizing to the Palestinian people. I talked, I talked about the fact that um, supporters or anyone else should never center themselves. They have to center the Palestinian people constantly. And I think someone like even Mr. Steiner here um, pointed out the contradictions of the Israeli government, failed to see his own contradictions when he said, for instance, that um, he's comfortable criticizing both Palestinians and Israelis, and he equivocated between the two. Yeah. But then he also actually referenced the military occupation of one of those people over the other. I don't think we can equivocate when we're very conscious of the fact that one of those people has colonized the land and is occupying the other person's land. To the second thing is, which is what's taken place both uh, in terms of what was just said by the gentleman there as well as Mr. Steiner, is, I mean, it drives me crazy to see the conditions that are placed on the Palestinian people that I've never seen placed on any other group of oppressed people in the world. Namely, that they can only lead a movement in which their oppressor will accept it. Yeah. Yeah. This, this has been said by both of them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine lecturing any other group of people? Can you imagine being alive during the civil rights era or going to South Africa during apartheid and talking to them about how they have to frame their movement within uh, a manner in which their oppressors will accept it? If that were the case, then my movement would be to get Palestinians out of Palestine because that's the only thing that will satisfy the Israelis. And the third and final thing that I want to say is that um, there seems to be uh, this general sentiment among many people that the BDS movement is unable to achieve its goals or unable to you know, accomplish anything. And uh, even Mr. Steiner, for instance, talked about um, the fact that it's been around for 14 years, as if it's a long time, but 14 years is not a long time. And you also referenced the fact that the Boycott South Africa movement went through Congress. It didn't. It ended in Congress in the late 1980s. It started in the 1950s. It took 35 years to get to Congress. I'm not interested in a movement in which I think Congress is going to approve it. It never starts there. It's always a grassroots movement. And sorry, actually, I do have one very, very quick point uh, in response to Joseph. Um, 
I'm not as concerned about the hate industry as I am about the peace industry because that's the only industry that's been around my entire life. And the only thing that peace and the peace process has meant to Palestinians is more land being taken, more death and destruction, and me not being able to ever connect to my roots and my homeland. So the peace industry for me is just as dangerous because it's only ever meant the exact opposite of that, which is why I'm interested in actual practical tactics.